The dishes. The baby was teetering on the edge of speech. Brew, she would say. Da, da, da. She had a way of looking at him as if she knew. Her forehead would furrow and her eyes would go dark as oil. Then he would pick her up and carouse around the room, giddy up, giddy up, horsey, whilst the mist pressed against the window from the sea, wet and dripping like bedding on a line. They were there for three months. His wife, Lorna, had a temporary posting and they'd be given the use of a small brick house in a terraced row. Theirs was on the end and it was backed onto a rough ground. Tussocks, bracken, horned sheep sprayed blue and red as if they were going into battle. Beyond that were fields, hedges tangled like wires, a few lonely farmhouses. The beaches were stony, the trees were not in leaf. In front of the house there was a road that hardly anyone drove along, then a barbed wire fence with no entry signs and cameras that pointed in all directions. Behind the fence were the dishes, where his wife went to work every morning and came back later and later into the evening. Sometimes she would have a shift in the middle of the night, and when Jay turned over in bed to hold her, she would be gone. The dishes were on the edge of the cliff and could be seen for miles, hard white shapes that looked like chess sets waiting to be played. They were data gatherers, listening stations, bigger than houses and smooth and silent. Some were full spheres, some were hexagonal, others hollowed like the dip in an ear. At the centre of each tilted dish, there was an antenna that reached upwards and sometimes, if Jay watched carefully, he would see them slowly turn like a flower might or someone following a voice that no one else could hear. It was early morning and Lorna had already left. Jay was in the kitchen clearing away the breakfast things. It was cold outside. Rain blew across the road in thin lines. He turned the heating up higher. The baby was strapped in her chair. He wiped her face with a warm cloth. Her skin was so soft, almost translucent, except for all the dried food stuck to it. It was on her cheeks and on the floor. Some was in her wispy hair. She laughed and squirmed while he wiped around her mouth, then puckered her lips and blew a bubble. Jay crouched down and tried to blow one too, but it didn't work and he ended up drooling down one corner of his mouth. The baby laughed and blew another one. How are you doing that, he said. Ham the fla, the baby told him. Oh, okay, Jay said. I thought you were doing it in a different way. He picked up the plates and put them in the sink, then ran the hot water until the washing liquid foamed up. He plunged his hands in and his wrists went red. What do you want to do today, he said. The baby banged her hands against the tray. Do you want to go out anywhere? She banged again. Or we could play the xylophone game. You seem to like it so much. She kept banging. Bang your hands if you've got food in your hair. She kept banging. Bang your hands if you woke up five times last night. She banged again. Bang your hands if you think I'm the best. She stopped banging. Jay ran more hot water and swiped plate after plate with the cloth until they were all stacked on the draining board. He liked washing up now. The hot water, the steam, how when he rinsed out a tin of tomatoes he pretended there'd been a shark attack. He liked the way the bubbles had bits of colour in them. He would blow them off his hands so that the baby could watch them floating. He hardly ever felt like smashing it against the wall anymore. He dried his hands and lifted the baby out the chair and onto her mat. There was an arched bar over it with bells hanging down. They made a dull jangling noise when she grabbed at them. They sounded like a doorbell and he wished he'd packed her other mat, the one without any bells. They hadn't brought much from home, just a suitcase for him and Lorna and a few boxes of baby things. He liked it that the house was small and empty. He could walk around each room seeing nothing that reminded him. Just a table, a couple of chairs, a sofa, a wilting pot plant on top of the fridge that he watered every day. He sat down next to the baby, then he got up again. If he sat down, he would fall asleep. He had that heavy, dull feeling behind his eyes which pushed down towards his jaw. It had been five times last night, the night before he'd lost count after seven. He straightened the curtains, the chairs, then picked up the cloth and wiped at another weird stain on the floor. Was this you? he said to the baby. She looked at him frowning like it was inappropriate to even ask. It wasn't even nine o'clock yet. After a while he noticed the sound of low voices coming through the kitchen wall. He stopped wiping the floor. There it was again, a low murmur of voices. The wall was thin and connected with next door, but he didn't think there was anyone living there. When they'd arrived, there weren't any lights on and there were no cars parked at the front. The curtains were half drawn and there was a pile of rubble by the steps, bricks and plaster that looked as if the room had recently been knocked through. He couldn't hear what they were saying. He stayed kneeling on the floor. Water dripped off the cloth and pulled next to his leg. The voices rose and fell and then they stopped. The baby let out a cry and he turned to her quickly. 
thought he heard a door open and close somewhere. The baby cried out again and he picked her up and cupped her warm head with his wet hands. The front door of the house next door opened, then shut with a bang. Jay sat upright in the kitchen chair, where he'd been slumped over a cup of coffee on the edge of sleep. It was mid-morning the next day. He glanced over the window. There was a man crossing the road further up, heading towards the dishes. Jay glimpsed the back of his coat before he disappeared through the gates. An hour later, there were footsteps behind the wall. Someone ran up the stairs and there was a strange rattling which might have been the curtains closing across their runners. It was misty again and too cold to go out. He brought the baby into the living room and turned on the electric fire. Soon the room was warm and fuggy and smelt like burnt dust. He brought out a box of toys and emptied it onto the floor. He put the rattle and the fraying bear in front of the baby, then found the spinning top, spun it up and let it go. It whirled and clinked out tiny music. He spun it up again. When he got bored, he styled the baby's hair into a Mohican. At lunchtime, someone drove up near the house. The engine revved, idled for a moment, then finally stopped. Jay glanced out. There was a dark blue van parked by the side of the road in the lay-by in front of the terrace. He strapped the baby in her chair and put her food in a pan to warm up. Mashed peas and potato, he told her. Classic choice. Fur of fru, the baby said. She twisted her bib up in her mouth and she was chewing on it. It'll be ready in a minute, Jay told her. I just want to make sure it's warm. He went over to the sink to wash his hands. He washed them twice and scrubbed under his nails. He'd read something about how easy it was to contaminate a baby's food, and since then he started washing his hands more and more every day. The skin around his nails was sore to touch. He dried his hands and filled the baby bowl with food. He sat down next to her and blew on it to cool it down. I just heated this up, now we have to wait for it to cool down, he said. Fru-fru, the baby said, trying to grab the spoon. She took a handful of food and aimed it at her mouth, but most of it ran down her wrist and back into the bowl. After a while, the voices started up behind the wall. They were louder this time, closer, although he couldn't make out any actual words. One was deep, the other sounded like a woman's voice. There was a lot of low, drawn-out laughter. Jay spooned the food into the baby's mouth. He wiped around her lips, then hooked his finger gently inside her cheek to make sure she wasn't storing any of it in there. She'd gone through a stage of doing that. He would find bits of food that she'd kept hidden all night. She squirmed and sucked at his finger. I'm only checking, he said. You have previous, remember? The voices came again through the wall. He got up and went over to the window. The van was still there. I'll be back in a second, he said. He went outside and knocked at next door. He waited, checking his hands for mashed up peas. What would he say? He didn't know. All he wanted was to speak to someone and not have them say frou-frou or whatever the hell it was back. But there was no sound from inside. Nothing moved, there was no lights on. Upstairs, the curtains were all drawn. Downstairs, there were neck curtains that were all frayed and yellowing. He would have to go right up and stare in to see past them. He turned round and looked at the road. The mist had almost covered the dishes. He could only see the one closest to the fence. The metal was dripping. The antenna was tilted towards the road. It almost looked like it was pointing at him. Was it pointing at him? He took a step towards it, then stopped and shook his head. It was pointing upwards, above the house, like it always did. He knocked once more, then turned and went back into his own house. He sat down at the table, spooned up the last bit of baby food and put it in her mouth. The voices started up again, and someone laughed. He got up so quickly that his chair tipped over. He went back outside and stood there, looking around. There was no one. The van was still parked by the side of the road. It was dusty and there was sand on the tyres. When he looked out again later, the van had gone. At night, he watched his wife sleeping. She slept straight away, as soon as she checked the baby and got into bed. There was dark smudges under her eyes, as if Sut had gathered in a fireplace. Sometimes she murmured and rolled away from him to the other side of the bed. Sometimes she rolled onto his chest and buried her face in his ribs. She murmured things he couldn't really hear. What? He would ask her. What? He smoothed back her hair and rubbed her shoulder blades to settle her back into sleep. What do you do over there all day, he asked. But he knew she wasn't allowed to answer. Often, the pillow would have creased the side of her cheek, and the creases would run into fine lines that had started to gather around her eyes. When her nightdress rode up, there was lines across her stomach and at the tops of her legs, the skin puckering like clay. He couldn't take his eyes off them. Finally, he would fall asleep, but after a few moments, he would jolt awake and freeze, sure that he'd been muttering, talking. What had he been saying? 
What if Lorna had woken up and heard him saying something? It was only once. It had only happened once. The doorbell had rung and he opened it and Lorna had been working. She was always working and had been on his own for such a long time. The baby had been in the other room. He put music on and afterwards he checked and she was deep in sleep, her arms and legs flung outward and her hand clutching her rabbit and that warm, sour, milky smell clinging to her which reminded him of the corridors of school many years before, how he used to get lost in the twisting maze of them. He pressed his ear close to the kitchen wall. The van had arrived at midday, while Jay was changing the baby. There'd been no sound from next door all morning, and he'd started to think that the van was probably there to do repairs to one of the houses further along the row. Now and again, drilling and hammering would reverberate down the terrace like a heartbeat. But then someone had run up the stairs, the banister had creaked, a door somewhere further back seemed to shut softly. He turned away from the wall and back to the baby, who was tipping herself backwards in the chair, trying to get out. She'd been restless all morning, crying whenever he went out of the room and throwing down toys, but if he picked her up, she would go rigid and try to twist out his arms. Her cheeks were hot and she kept scratching at her belly, and when he rubbed it for her, she just cried again. He offered up her favourite toys, the rabbit, the jangly ball, but she batted them away. He looked around, saw only the road, the mist, the cliffs, the dishes. He slumped down in the chair and rested his head on the table. It had not been possible before to know that this kind of tiredness existed. He could hardly even lift his head. When he did manage to look up, the baby had slumped down too, in her chair, and she was watching him with her head cocked sidewards. He sat up, then covered his eyes with his hands. The baby did the same. He waved his hands, and the baby waved her hands. She watched him, without blinking to see what he would do next. Then someone said, shh, suddenly and loudly from behind the wall. The baby opened her eyes wide. Shh, she said. Shh, the voice came again from behind the wall. The baby looked around the room, then back at Jay. Shh, she said. Jay shook his head. You don't need to do that, he told her. Shh, the baby said again. Jay got up and went over to her. Don't do that. She looked at him with a wide, dark eyes. The sound came again from the wall. Jay went over and knocked on it. Once, twice. Loud and hard. Above him, on the roof, a tile slipped and grated in the wind. Shh, the baby said, quieter this time. There was a swing tied to a branch of a tree at the back of the house. It was small and sturdy, with high sides for a child. Jay had tested it and tested it again, pulling down with all his strength to see if anything gave. He put the baby in her coat and opened the back door. The misty rain had finally stopped. It was good to feel the wind against his face. He put the baby in the swing and pushed it gently. The change creaked as they moved against the tree. He pushed and pushed and it was cold and quiet and he thought of nothing except pushing the swing and the wet, salty smell of the fields behind him. When he looked up at the house, there was someone standing in the window. He fumbled with the swing, missed the middle of it, and ended up pushing the baby sideways. The swing lurched outwards, rocked, then righted itself. It was just his wife wearing her coat and carrying her bag ready to leave for work. He didn't know how long she'd been standing there. He thought she'd already gone. She was wearing the green scarf he'd bought her just after they first met. He hadn't seen her wearing it for a long time. He raised his hand and waved. Lorna's mouth moved, but he couldn't tell what she was saying. He realised he'd been pushing the swing quite high and probably harder than he should. The baby was laughing and kicking her legs with each push, but now she slowed it down, keeping it low, feeling himself, making a show of how careful he was been. The baby screamed indignantly, but he kept pushing the swing very gently. The next time he looked up, the window was empty, except for the blurred reflection of the swing moving backwards and forwards slowly across the glass. A phone rang next door. It rang, then cut out, then rang again. No one answered it. Jay strapped the baby in the pram and pushed her hat further down over her head. She looked up at him and her face creased. Her eyes were exactly the same as Lorna's. Sometimes it seemed like she was right there staring out at him. When Lorna and the baby looked at each other, it was as if something secret passed between them, something that he wasn't allowed to know. Half for ma, she asked. Her cheeks were already red and cold. We need to get out of the house, Jay told her. Bachelor ham. Yeah, I know, it's bloody cold, but we need to get out of the house. He put another blanket over her. She stared out sternly from under all the layers. He tucked the blanket in, then started walking down the road. The pram's wheels sent up spray from the wet tarmac. 
The road was steep and narrow, with high hedges on both sides. If a car came, there'd be nowhere to go. They would have to turn and walk all the way back, but he needed to get out of the house. It had rained for three days in a row, heavy showers that didn't stop. The gutters had spilled over and poured down the window. They stayed in and turned the heaters up high. Small noises had come through the walls, murmurs, footsteps, low laughter. Sometimes he was sure it was just the pipes or the rain. There was a thin, raw mist, as if the ground couldn't absorb any more water, so the wetness had moved into the air itself. Soon his nose was numb and dripping, and his fingers were stiff against the handle of the pram. The road sloped down and small trees twisted on either side, their trunks bright with moss. It got colder the lower he went into the valley. He could hear the sea somewhere in the distance. Water ran down the road and splashed up his legs. It looked orange like it was leaking through rusty iron. The mist thickened into drizzle and he shivered. He crouched down and tucked the baby in tighter. She was making cooing sounds at the gorse, trying to reach out and grab it. He showed her the prickles, but she grabbed at it anyway. There was gorse everywhere, like lamps in the hedges. It gave out a sweet, heavy smell. The drizzle came in waves, sweeping across the tops of the trees and hanging there like curtains. The road narrowed again. Something moved in the dead leaves under the tree. He walked slowly, checking every bend before carrying on. He came to the bottom of the road and it forked. One way turned into a track that followed a stream. The other seemed to bend inland. He took that one and kept going. There was no road signs, just hedges and fields and the valley below him. The trees huddled like a herd of animals escaping the weather. Sa, the baby asked. He stroked her damp cheek with his finger. There was the sound of a motor in the distance, coming closer, and he walked forward to find a wider bit of road. Whatever it was, it was moving fast, the engine revving. He smelled the petrol before he saw it. There was no wider bit of road. He walked back quickly away from the bend. He crammed the pram in sideways against the hedge, mounting the wheels up on the bank and pressing it as far as it would go. It was a dark blue van. It came careening round the corner of the lane and revved past him before he could see who it was. The wing mirror brushed against him as it went. Jay jumped out and shook his fist at the back of the van. You asshole! he shouted. You irresponsible son of a bitch asshole! He got the pram out of the hedge. The baby had a handful of dried leaves in each fist and was chewing on a stick. He took the stick out of her mouth and crouched down to check she was okay. Don't ever repeat what I just said, he told her. The baby looked at him then back down at the leaves she was holding. He stood in the middle of the road. No one else went past. He saw no one except a farmer, small and faint, walking through a field in the distance. The baby went to sleep. Her hands slackened and the leaves fell out. He turned and started walking back. Soon the dishes rose up in front of him. One of them was pointing down the valley. It stayed like that all night. His wife hummed low, monotonous tunes in the shower, she used to sing pop song ballads, those deep, soulful ones where she used the shower head as a microphone. But now she just hummed the same thing over and over, quietly and without stopping, like static on an old radio. While she was in the shower, music started up behind the wall. It was slow, but with a heavy beat that thundered through the floor. It was coming from somewhere near the kitchen. Then it faded and seemed to move into the living room, then down the hall as if it was in the pipes or in the wires. Jay's heart gave a strange lurch, he banged on the wall. Stop it, he said. He banged again. Stop it. The music didn't stop. He followed it through the house. It was loud nearer the bathroom. When he went in, it sounded like it was in the room, low and slow and echoing off the tiles. He could see Lorna through the steam. She was washing her hair and there was soap and bubbles all over her head. She was humming and her eyes were closed. There was a thump near the door and then the sound of breathing only a few inches from where Jay was standing. A cold draught came under the door. Any moment now, Lorna would rinse off the soap and take her hands away from her ears, and then she would hear. The breathing got louder. The music surged. Lorna ducked her head under the water and shampoo ran down her neck and onto her shoulders. He stood in the middle of the room, clenching his hands. His nails dug into his palms. He could tell even behind the music the particular way the body would be pressing against the wall. Stop, he said silently. Stop it. Lorna shook her wet hair and turned off the shower. The music stopped. She opened her eyes and when she saw Jay, she let out a faint cry and put her hand on her chest, looking at him for a moment as if she didn't recognise him at all. The phone rang from behind the wall. It rang and then cut out. Then it rang again. Still, no one answered. It was lunchtime and Jay was cleaning up. The baby had woken him every few hours in the night and he kept knocking things onto the floor. Cups, bits of food. 
The baby would lean down out of the chair and try to help him pick them up, then almost topple out. So he would straighten her, and then she would do it again, clapping her sticky hands. Sue Lorna would be home, and he would start cooking something for dinner. He ran the sink full of hot water. It was cold in the house. His hands were cold, and he was looking forward to dipping them in. An engine revved suddenly, and he looked up just in time to see the van speed away past the window. The tyres left a burning smell on the air. He picked up a plate and put it in the sink. He washed it and stacked it on the draining board. Bubbles ran down and pulled into the grooves. He started on another plate. A door slammed and someone shouted from behind the wall. He fumbled with the plate, dropped it in the sink, and hot water splashed over his feet. There was a bang, then voices. Why did you... Someone said, why did you do it? There was another bang and a long silence. Jay picked up the plate. It had cracked down the middle. He stroked the baby's cheek. She seemed fine. She was pushing a bit of cracker around her tray, jabbing it until it was wet and crumbly. Hmm, fur, she said, pointing at it. It's okay, Jay told her. It's okay. He dried his hands, sat down, then got up and opened the door. He went outside and paced around the front of the houses. There were no cars. The house next door looked empty. In another house further up the row, washing billowed on the line, trousers and shirts straining against their pegs as if they were trying to get away. Something moved behind next door's window. Jay ran to the door and raised his hand to knock. His hand was in a fist. It was almost on the door, then he stopped and brought his hand down. He stood on the step for a long time. The baby watched him. What's she doing? She said one morning. She looked at him carefully as if she was waiting for an answer. His wife got home late and they sat, almost asleep, on the sofa in front of the TV. Jay flicked through the channels. There were old programmes on that they used to watch, repeats that seemed half familiar, the jokes coming in slightly different places than he remembered. He put his arm round Lorna and she leaned her head back against him. He could see the freckle behind her ear. It was tiny, hardly more than a dot. He used to kiss her there. She yawned and leaned in closer. Her hair was kinked from wearing headphones at work most of the day. Her eyes were dry and flecked with red. The audience on the TV laughed raucously at something and he found the remote and turned it down. He could hear her watch ticking. There was a phrase they used to say to each other when they first met, something about clocks or time because she always used to be late and he was about to say it to her. He used to make her laugh but he couldn't remember it. He'd seen her earlier on his phone and he'd grabbed it, almost yanked it out of her hands but she was just checking a friend's number. His hand had been shaking and he'd gone upstairs so that she wouldn't notice. He turned the volume up on the TV again and Lorna sighed and shifted her head so that it was against the cushion instead of his chest and her hips moved just slightly away from his. His hand started to shake again, but it was nothing. He'd deleted everything, there'd been no more phone calls. Any moment now she would turn back and lean against him again. He was putting away the washing up, the cups, the plates and glasses, in the cupboards and drawers. Everything was clean, dinner was cooking, he was ahead for once. He lined the cups up carefully and stacked the plates on top of each other. The glasses caught the light and gleamed. A glass fell and smashed against the floor. He reached up automatically to the shelf to stop any more falling, but nothing had fallen. There was no broken glass anywhere. There was another loud smash from behind the wall. He put his hand over his ears and waited for it to stop. The dishes were moving. If he hadn't been watching them every day, he might not have noticed, but he did watch them every day, and he saw them move. Soon they would be pointing straight in at the kitchen window. The van was there again. He hadn't heard it drive up or any doors opening and closing, but it was there. Jay watched it out of the window. He checked on the baby. He went back to the window, waited a moment, then went outside. He walked over to the van and looked at it. There was an empty plastic bottle under the seat and a newspaper on the dashboard from a week earlier. He circled the van twice in the drizzle, then thought about the number plate. What he should do was write down the number plate. He ran inside and found a pen, then crouched down next to the van to write. The number plate was covered in mud, and he rubbed at it, saw an X and a 7, then rubbed again, but the mud was too thick and wouldn't come off. When he looked up, there was a light in one of the next door's windows. It flicked on, then off. The curtains upstairs moved. He walked over to the house. He glanced back at the road, then went closer, right up to the window. The rooms downstairs were dark. He pressed his ear against the glass but couldn't hear anything. Something moved further back in the house. Maybe it was an arm or someone's back. He just glimpsed something crossing into another room. He ran round the side of the house, down the alley and through the long grass on the bank. He scrabbled over the brambles, dropped the pen and scratched his hand on a broken bit of fence. There was a low wall behind the house next door. He jumped down softly. The back door was padlocked. 
the windows were shut and dark. He stayed crouched against the concrete, the neck curtains swayed against the glass. Something rustled in the bank above him. The rustling got louder and then blackbirds ran out towards him, scowling loudly. He moved closer to the windows. They were smeared and dusty, but he was sure there was something back there in the darkness. He went closer. A voice murmured and someone laughed. There was a shout behind him. He turned quickly. It was the farmer he'd seen in the field. She was walking towards him, calling out, asking what he was doing. He looked at her, then back at the window. He realised his hand was on the latch. His fingers were rigid and scratched. The nails bit him right down. It didn't look like his hand. He turned and ran, disappearing into his own house. He jumped at small noises. When the baby broke her bowl, he brushed up every single piece with the dustpan. He picked out the tiny shards from the cracks between the tiles. It turned very cold. He stayed up late into the night with his ear to the kitchen wall, just the blue light from the fridge and the white security lights coming in through the thin curtains. He paced the kitchen. When the baby cried, he went straight to her and lifted her out of the cot and held her while he paced. She shaped her mouth into a sound and then gave up and blew a sticky bubble instead and sighed. It's okay, he told her. It's okay. Then he went back to the wall and listened. He pressed so hard that bits of paint flaked off onto the floor. He left Lorna sleeping in bed and came downstairs and listened all night. He heard the music again, faintly this time, somewhere towards the back of the house. Another time there was a hushed, crying sound like someone had left a tap slowly running. I know, I know, the baby said. She opened her eyes wide. Shh, she said. The phone next door rang, cut out, then rang again. Jay stopped turning his phone on. He put it under a box in the wardrobe, then in a drawer. After a few days, he took it out and threw it into the brambles behind the back window. Someone was leaving. He heard it clearly and distinctly. The baby looked at him, her head to one side. What? she said. She frowned. A very cold feeling washed over Jay. It went from his neck down to his feet, almost rooting him to the floor. The voice came again through the wall. It was a man's voice, but not as deep as the one he usually heard. Going, it said. The only thing too. A cupboard opened, then drawers opened, and something heavy was dragged across the floor. A zip crunched. Jay picked up the baby and held her to his chest. He stood by the front door. Footsteps thudded through the wall. More cupboards creaked open. He put the baby in her coat, then went outside. He crossed the front yard. The van wasn't there. It was cold and the dishes seemed poised, tensed. They were pointing straight at him. His breathing was fast and shallow. He held the baby tight and she pressed into his neck. Da, she said. There was no sound except for a rook coying from a wet branch. The house next door was in front of him. The door was half open. Jay walked over to it slowly. He went up the step. The rubble was still there. It was wet and bits of plaster had spread over the ground like snow. He pushed the door slowly and it swung inwards. It was quiet in there. There was no shoes by the door, no coats on the hooks. The hallway was long and dark. He turned and looked back towards where Lorna would be working. He imagined her at her desk by a computer listening. He thought of how he would tell her. He suddenly remembered the phrase they used to say to each other. The phone rang. He held the baby tight. He took a deep breath and stepped inside.